everybody for staying. It's, um, it's lunchtime, so I know it's hard for you to, to, to be here uh, on an empty stomach. Uh, so I really appreciate it that, that, that you take the time to listen to our talk. Um, so today we would like to talk about some of our research we started two years ago, and we would like to present the results on that research. First of all, I would like to introduce our, ourselves. Um, so my name is uh, Matthias Madu. Uh, right now I'm at Inviso and I'm running the software security practice. So um, what we essentially do, we have a, a focus on the financial institutions, mainly in Belgium where we provide software security uh, uh, help with what they try to achieve uh, within the financial institutions. Before that, I was at, at Fortify, which was later acquired by HP, uh, where I filled out various roles in, in research to, to product management to uh, actually various roles within, within Fortify and within HP. Um, how did I roll into Fortify? Well, uh, before I joined Fortify, I was doing a PhD at, uh, on, on application security at, at Ghent University, uh, where I studied code obfuscation through static analysis. And through that static analysis angle, I rolled into Fortify with, with their SEA product. And I like to uh, speak at, at various conferences. That's my slide. So I'm done. Uh, I'm also a security researcher at Enviso. So a few of the projects that we focus on is our malware scanner. That's basically the focus of today, the presentation. We also have Cybersecurity Challenge uh, Belgium. So it's an event that we organize to attract students and uh, so that we can cherry pick the best from the university. And we also do quite some hacking on ATMs, but that's not the topic of today. So if you're here for the ATMs, you can sneak out now. So um, what would we like to talk about today? Well, uh, we would like to talk about malware and Android. So the combination of uh, malware and Android. And that's essentially what, uh, what the outline of today is. So we, we first of all try to figure out like, hey, how big is the problem with malware and, and how big of a role does uh, Android play in that? After that, we're going to look at our APK scan that we designed and, and that is free to use on, uh, on our website. And we also created a public API so that you can use and you can upload samples and you can scan them so that it's, it's more convenient for you. Uh, then we go to the statistics. So Dan is going to take over and is going to talk a little bit about the malware that we found, the various types of malware that we found, uh, everything around statistics, essentially. And we also talk about uh, future work. Essentially, we do a lot of collaborations with universities in Belgium uh, where, where we work closely together with the students and we would like to improve this whole project so that everybody benefits from it. Okay, mobile malware. Um, There's already a question. My question, you focus on Android. Yes. Is from iOS less? I'm sorry? Do you want to take that one? Yeah, um, we focus indeed on Android. There's a few statistics on the, the share market, right? So basically the share of iOS versus Android with users. So Android is the largest platform, so that's already a reason to focus there. Mm -hmm. I also think the app ecosystem on, um, on Android is a bit more vulnerable. The way apps are deployed into the markets, there's third-party app markets that, make it, that makes it quite a bit more dangerous. It, exposes the user, the user. There's also the permission model that's quite different on iOS than on Android. That's also covered in the presentation. Um, so I think that'll become a bit yeah. more clear uh, through the slides. Yeah. So what we see right now is, is more and more the movement from uh, Windows malware to where, towards mobile phones. So essentially you can ask yourself like, hey, why, why are the hackers interested in, in writing malware for the mobile phones? Well, the, the truth of the matter is, Right now, we do more and more things on our mobile phone. We do banking, which, which what we not what we not did before. Uh, we we ask for cabs. Um, we we buy stuff over the internet. So we do more and more of our day-to-day -day life on a mobile phone, and that's essentially what the hackers are going after. Because more money moves over your phone, so if they can steal some of that, well, that's quite interesting for them. So, as you can see, it it, it pops up in in the news quite a lot. But then still the question comes like, hey, how, why, is essentially your question like, hey, why do you focus on Android? And really what we see right now is this huge boom in, in Android devices. If you look at market share, simple market share on Android devices, they, they are up to 80% and only 20% goes to the other iPhone, Blackberry, Microsoft, and maybe some others, a Palm, if somebody still uses a Palm, I don't know. Um, so who is, sorry, who is not using iOS or Android? 
Who is not using Windows Phone? Those, okay, nobody. How One what, person. What are you using? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a paranoid in the room. <laughs> So if, if we look at then the distribution, like if you, if you throw all malware into one bucket and you're gonna split it up, so how much is, is, is Android malware and how much is Windows malware and what is the other bucket? And if, if you do that, um, uh, Alcatel Lucent figured out that right now 60% of the malware, if you ever throw, it, throw everything in one bucket, is really Android malware. And only 40% is Windows, so it, it's really taken over Windows. And less than 1% is all the other devices. And, and that's, that's, I think, again, confirmed by others, like for instance, Sophos Labs, they say, hey, what we see a lot, we see a huge spike right now in the number of samples of, of Android malware, and that, that's what we see. So this graph goes up to January 2014, but you see this, this rapid increase of malware that's coming out for Android. One thing, so what we focus on with, with Inviso is really uh, the, 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 the financials and, and mainly in Belgium. So for us, it's really interesting to figure out like, hey, how much of that malware really focuses the, the, the banking sector, the financials? And what we see is over there, like uh, also a rapid increase in, in uh, number of samples of malware for, for the financial institution. And that's exactly where we would like to focus on. So we would like to focus on like, hey, why is there such a rapid increase in, in Android? What is that particular piece of malware doing? How can you spot pieces of malware? And so on and so forth. All right, malware analysis. Um, there are various ways to do malware analysis. And, and broadly speaking, what we focused on was um, static analysis and behavior analysis. So static analysis really is where you, you take the, 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 the APK and you do not execute it. Right? So you're just going to look at the code and you're going to try to figure out what that code is doing. You can build up a model, you can use grep, and you're going to try to figure out, hey, what, that, what is that code doing? And is that doing something malicious? It has a lot of advantages, like, hey, um, if, it's, if it's in there, if it's baked in there, you can simply uh, find it, if uh, you can fingerprint it. It has some problems too, you know, like there's these obfuscators for, for Android. Uh, 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 Dex guard and stuff like that. So if, if it's obfuscated, it's harder to inspect, of course, because all the code is mingled. Um, also, stuff that happens at runtime will not show up through static analysis because you're not executing it at all. Behavior analysis will fix some of these problems, all right? But it has other problems then, of course. So behavior analysis will definitely, well, if something shows up at runtime, you will definitely see it, right? Um, on the other hand, it has some problems like sometimes it's slow. Also, if you do not execute a particular path, well, you're not going to find it, right? So if you're not executing the malware, if you do not know how to tickle the malware, then you're not going to find a piece of malware. And we have a lot of examples on that too. So quick reminder, how do you create an Android APK? So you take your source. You compile it with your Java compiler, then you go to, to, the, to the Delvic bytecode, it's is very similar to Java. You build it into an Android package, you sign it, and you throw it onto the Google Play Store. Um, one remark, of course, is, is that Dex is going to be replaced with uh, a, um, uh, ART. Uh, how do you go back? So what are we looking at right now? So we take these APKs, we unzip them, so we have some Delvic bytecode. We use a, a tool called Dex2Jar to go back to, to Java, and we use uh, tools like JD Code or JD GUI to really look at the Java code. And that's what we're using for our static analysis engine. So we really go back to the source code, and the source code is what we're using for static analysis. So really, on that source code, we start building a model, we apply uh, 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 analysis, and then we figure out if, if there's uh, malware in there or not. We also do behavior analysis. Um, so what we do over there is, is we, we, we t took uh, uh, Taindroid and uh, we modified it a little bit, so, well, a little bit heavily, essentially, to uh, make sure that we got more analysis in there, so that we, get, we, got, we got some screen capturing in there. Uh, so we really modified Taindroid, so we execute uh, the application itself, and in the background, we also inserted some hooks so we can get some information out of Taindroid, more of, of what's uh, currently available. So we get all sorts of information out there. What we also do, what you can see on the screen, is we click stuff. 
Okay, because normally if you run an emulator and it's all automated, well, if nobody clicks anything, well, nothing, gonna, nothing is going to happen. So we, what we do over here is we randomly click the screen so that it's going to execute some parts. Of course, this can be, um, uh, this can, this can be better. But if you want to scale that, if you want to do that for 100,000 applications, I cannot ask like a student to constantly tap the screen and figure out all the paths. So what we've done is some, some random uh, uh, generator that just randomly clicks the screen. All right. <laughs> so what we see right now is in if, if, we, if we took, if you take APKs, what we see right now is that fingerprinting malware is no longer viable. So right now what we see is that the, the, the malware becomes more and more sophisticated and essentially when you download an app, what the, the, the people are sometimes doing if you, if you try to download a malicious app is they try to make a unique uh, application for you so that fingerprinting no longer works. And, and the way they do that is, is first of all they send you to a different link and they make a different copy of it. And it's a lot done through, I'm sorry, uh, it's a lot done uh, through um, using different keys if you encrypt your APK, uh, using different stubs in the APK itself. So what they're trying to do is they have some sort of a library of pieces of code that are the same, that are, have the same functionality, and they're using, they're swapping that in and out so that it's very hard to create a fingerprint of that one particular application. So yeah. that's something. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, just wanted to give even one very simple example. We see samples where a single text file is added to the zip with a random string of five or six characters, and that, of course, changes the hash uh, of, of the entire application. Mm -hmm. That is even sufficient to bypass a lot of antivirus. That, of course, is then just going to fingerprint the APK and say, I'm done with it, I don't know this sample, uh, submit it for analysis. So even those very basic checks can, uh, can already bypass AV. Um, I think this is one of the, the, the first that we, we found of, mm -hmm. of server uh, polymorphism. Um, and, and once we found it, well, first of all, none of the 57 uh, scanners that, 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 that otherwise try to figure out if, if there's malware, this, the 57 that we looked at, were not able to find it. But if you execute it, so what we do is really executing in an emulator, we were able to spot this particular piece of, of malware. In, in Hotspot Shield. And what they did essentially, so we dug a little bit deeper in there, that what they used was they used different keys to essentially encrypt the APK, also encrypt the traffic that goes over the wire. So even if you uh, try to figure out the traffic over the wire, and if you know one of these keys, well, you can decrypt one of that particular stream, but if they use 15, 15 different ones and you only know one, well, there's still 14 different flavors that you cannot find. Um, and, uh, and I think this is a, a still the same sample. Mm -hmm. So what we've done in there is uh, we've taken various um, uh, samples that, that, that were uh, encoded in a different way or, or uh, packed in a different way. We um, extracted them and we started looking for, for information. Um, and essentially what we saw through our emulator is uh, th these pieces of data that were uh, created internally and then encrypted and sent over the wire. And when we did some, some Google search, we actually figured out that there was some, some Java file with this particular uh, uh, malware information in there. So they were using some snippets of, of known malware. Um, Monkey Jump is, I think, the first one that we found with server-side polymorphism. What yeah, was, what that was, was the previous one. It was even one of the very first apps that was uploaded to APK scan that was malicious. So we were quite excited when we saw that one coming in. Um, what, what this one is doing is in the background. So the malware is in the background sending uh, a text to to premium numbers and. Um, We've taken that one malware sample, and then we actually went back to our, uh, to our uh, uh, um, uh, bucket of all applications, and we tried to figure out, like, hey, how many of the same applications have this, uh, the same piece of malware? And we found more of them. So we found way more of that same piece of malware encoded in a different way, but they were all doing the same thing, which was sending uh, text to, to premium numbers. Yeah, that's also a fully functional game, so just trojanized, <laughs> taken from the App Store, uh, it's trojanized so that people leave it on their phone. It's a fun game, and while you're playing, those text messages are, are being sent. In later versions of, of uh, Android right now, you actually see a message saying, look, you're about to send a message through an app to a paid number. 
do you want to do this? So that's partially mitigated with, uh, with newer versions. All right, APK scan itself. Yeah, the, I think there's a question. So, um, so we have to repeat the question. So, so yeah. Karsten is asking, like, what do we do with with uh, with the malicious app? So, if if we find something malicious, what do we do with that? It depends. If it's uploaded by a user who is anonymous, well, we can look for it in stores, but very often we don't find any traces of it. On the other hand, if it's in an official app store, we also pull in samples ourselves actively. We scan them. We actually can do a takedown request if it's malware, and we do that actively. Yeah, also for our clients, we actually monitor the app stores for their brand. We take apart all these APKs, we look for logo abuse. If it's a very serious issue like a banking trojan, then we, we take active measures and we contact the stores. Most of the time they're taken, uh, taken out the stores yeah. within uh, 24 hours. Yeah. And even on the, the Google Play Store, they can remove samples that are already installed on a phone uh, for the, the app. So that's quite, quite a, a powerful functionality. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Cool. So we started two years ago with, with uh, Inviso R&D um, with, with our scanner, which we call APK scan. And you can use it freely online. So you can, if you, if you think you have some piece of malware, you can upload it over there. We're going to scan it. We give you all the results back. So it's, it's very different from, from other scanners where they keep most of the, the information themselves. We really share everything that we know about that application. And, um, and so we, we've implemented static analysis and behavior analysis, and right now we, uh, we've scanned up to 30,000 unique samples, and that, that's really when we submitted this, this proposal. Right now we're, we're up way more because we actually collaborate with more uh, research and development organizations on sharing information, sharing samples. Uh, so we, we see way more right now. Uh, so at, at that time when, I submitted it, when we submitted the talk, we had 30,000 unique samples and 6,000 of them were pieces of malware. And, and that's why we came up with, with that particular title. Um, and and we, scan, we scan them, we share everything with the community. Very, very quickly, high level, how does it work? I'm not going to spend too much time on that because we want to go to the details. So essentially, you, 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 have, you have two mechanisms. You can upload something, and we're going to scan it for you, but we also actively pull from various stores, and we scan the APK. Uh, what we do, what's very interesting, I think, is um, in the background, uh, let's see, in the background over here, uh, we have various workers. So we have various workers, and why do we do that? Well, for example, what we see is if an application is, is, is opened in a different country, sometimes you have a different screen. So for, for malware, based on the country you're in, they're going to show you a different banking app. If, uh, of course, an app or, or a bank that works and that is operating in that particular, in, in that particular uh, uh, country. So, same is true for, for devices. Some of these devices contain uh, vulnerabilities that are exploited by the malware. So for instance, if it's on a Nexus, it's only it's, it only works for a Nexus. So we really have to have an emulator for Nexus-specific uh, malware. Otherwise, we will not find it. If we are always using uh, uh, um, uh, another device, we're not going to find that, or we, we're not going to identify that APK as a piece of malware. So right now, we have various workers, various emulators. Uh, we actually also have hardware devices, so physical devices where we execute the APKs on. And we, we try to figure out what that APK is doing and if it's malicious or not. All right. I'll leave it up to yeah. Dan. Thanks. Uh, the clicker. Here we go. Thank you. So a few statistics. Um, overall, we analyzed about 50,000 apps when we released the, um, the presentation. So that's about half of those are user submitted, so anonymous samples that we just discussed. The other one, uh, the other half, is, is really samples that we actively pull in from third-party app stores. We sometimes scan through the Google Play Store, but they have quite a bit of restrictions on that. They don't like actively uh, people scraping their content. Obviously, they have their own bouncer. Uh, it's called their own implementation of a scanner. Uh, so most of these samples are really found in the wild in third-party uh, app stores. Client activity, to give you an overview, about 350 unique samples a day um, overall. So most of these come from app stores, and we're already quite a bit up there. It's, I think, 150 unique samples that we have uh, through user uploads. So 
Does anyone have an idea why we could have a huge drop around that last uh, part of the, I don't know how to point with this one, uh, here? Anyone wants to take a guess? Yeah, there's no date, but it just at one, suddenly we saw a huge drop in traffic. Basically, we ran out of disk space. So that was quite a panic. Normally we get like daily reports on uploaded samples. Suddenly we got, hey, someone uploaded one sample today and that was it. So we fixed that and we started analyzing. Um, over all the, f the samples that we analyzed, about 8% is confirmed malicious. 17% is suspicious and you can already guess a bit the categories there, spyware, uh, adware. Sometimes it's difficult to know if an app is trying to help you um, or if it's trying to maliciously track you. That's, uh, that's about 17% and then 75 is uh, confirmed to contain no uh, malicious, or we think, we presume. Uh, we didn't identify anything so we cannot report it. An overview of the, um, that breakdown but then by user submitted samples and the app stores. So we see about 4% of the apps that we pull in from the app stores are malicious. Uh, if you only look at the Google Play Store, we sometimes get that question. It's much less than that. It's uh, way below uh, 1%. But still a lot of people are getting apps through third-party channels, so we think that's, uh, that's a fair comparison. Um, we get 12% tw there is yeah, malicious from user uploads. Why? Well, mostly researchers are using our service. They already has a, have a suspicion on the maliciousness of an app. Um, we get uploads from all over the world. Uh, this is just a nice graph, but I'll skip it. Um, the top malware signatures that we get overall, most of them are really Trojans. So apps that are re being repackaged. Think about that monkey uh, game that we just showed you. Users leave that app on the device, it becomes persistent, and in the background it's doing all kinds of uh, malicious activity. That shield application that Matthijs uh, showed, that's exactly the same. Air push, that's, um, yeah, that's really malware. Um, it's between malware and adware. It's a bit difficult to say, but it's quite persistent adware. Suspicious category, there's still a lot of samples that we cannot categorize, basically. Um, we see, for example, that it's sending out personal identifying information over the wire at runtime, but no idea what the purpose is. It could be adware, it could be command and control. Uh, difficult to say. And then here we have a, a pie chart. So it summarizes a bit the result. If you look at exploits, that was a bit of a surprise to us. Less than 2% of all the malware samples that we analyze use an exploit on the device. Almost all of these samples, they abuse the permission schema uh, on an Android phone. So top 10 permissions requested, and I'll just give you a second to look through these uh, to see if you recognize a few of them. Can we show of, uh, do a show of hands again of the Android users? Yeah, quite a lot. So internet access, network access, phone state, uh, Wi-Fi access, those are really the, the usual suspects. So what do we do? We try to look for permissions that are requested considerably more often by malware rather than goodware. And then we come up with this definition of dangerous permissions. Then we get a quite interesting view. We see permissions that are requested much more frequent by malware. So what's there? Receive boot complete, so that makes malware persistent. Um, so whenever uh, the, the phone is rebooted after the installation of the app, the malware sample can get a notification and it can start uh, bootstrapping itself. Reading the phone state, that's really to leak personal identifying information or uh, technical details about the phone. Typically used to track a user, to send back to command and control, look, uh, this phone checked in. Leak your location. We also see more and more uh, malware that is leaking browser history, your processes, contacts, Google account details. So it's becoming much more interesting uh, for a sample to aggregate all this information, send it to command and control server, and even based on what is sent back, they can then decide if they further track you, if they even remove the malware remotely from the system. We've seen those, uh, those instances in our, in our workers. Leaking text messages, 
typically uh, banking trojans, and we actually see an example of that in a, in a few slides. So at least 40% of the dangerous permissions, that's the first conclusion, are directly linked to information leakage. That's quite scary, because it's difficult to categorize an app as being malicious or goodware based on the leakage of, of device information, right? It could just be an app registering your email number uh, to say, look, this device has enrolled. It's perfectly legitimate to do uh, for certain applications. So that really ends up in the bucket of suspicious applications, but quite often they also bypass um, the Google Bouncer. So they end up in the, the Google Play Store. An overview of other information that we've seen leaked. Uh, call logs is an interesting one. So a full overview of the numbers that you've dialed, uh, including the, the call time. So how often do we see this information leakage? Well, overall, we see it in about 14% of all samples uh, across, uh, across APK scans. So that's about 50,000 apps that we scanned. If we only look at the suspicious and malicious category, then it's more than half of them uh, that leak device uh, identifying information. So based on the stuff that they leak, they can uniquely identify your phone uh, out of all the phones that, are, uh, that exist on planet Earth. How is that leaked? Well, there's a lot of information persisted on the drive and then at a later point uh, sent out over the network. In very few cases, we see that it's leaked over SMS. Uh, quite often, I think that's done to, to test our sandbox to see what, we are, uh, what kind of, uh, of OS we are running. Um, and you see it on the right, so the phone number is leaked, the email, the ECIT number, even the accelerometer. Anyone has an idea why someone, an attacker would want to know the position of the accelerometer? Creative guesses? Uh, if, it's, if it's a link and nobody's using it, maybe your malware detection? Yeah, it could be that they take over the phone whenever the phone is not moving, or maybe the other way around. Uh, yeah. They start tracking you maybe when you move. It could be, an idea. I haven't seen it. No, I'm just saying, if you're a malware detector, you, will move, you won't move the phone. Okay, you mean sandbox detection. Exactly. exactly, and that's indeed one of the examples that we've seen uh, being used, so they leak that accelerometer. We did a bit more looking into those samples, and it's quite obvious that they try to identify are we running in an emulator or not. So we'll need to start using we already have physical devices, but we'll need to put them on a test bed that moves or something to bypass that as sandbox detection. <laughs> yeah, move the sandbox, maybe send some, uh, some bogus data through the accelerometer. Um, yeah, there's some other permissions in that uh, top of dangerous uh, ones. Send and receive SMS, write SMS. Those are really used to steal banking tokens and to send um, premium rate uh, messages to yeah, quite often Eastern European numbers. So in the end, c conclusion of these permissions is that 55% of the most requested permissions are also part of the top 10 of most dangerous per permissions. So it makes it very, very difficult for a user to distinguish. You can be installing a non-malicious app and it's really difficult based on the permission model to know, hey, can I actually deduct from the requested permissions, if it's malware or not. And that's quite often the only indication a user has, right? Uh, the overview of permissions, so that's quite problematic. I think a good example of this, super bright LED flashlight. We looked it up for the presentation. I think it is a top scoring flashlight app on the official app store from Google, so the Play Store. Which permissions do you think the flashlight requests? And I'll give you a tip, there is indeed a permission to enable the flashlight. Location, yeah, yeah, I think those are, we can actually do permission bingo with this one. Because eh? if you look at the, the list, it, it asks uh, for access to Wi-Fi, camera, microphone, already no clue why you would do that for a flashlight app. Receive data, control the flashlight, so it's in there. Nice, so it probably works. Yeah, that's possible. But full network access, retrieve all your running apps, the history of your running apps, your calls, those kind of things, that's to me quite, quite worrying. Reading the phone state, and still it's an extremely popular app. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, that's possible. Yeah. So th there's still quite a lot of things there. I think that that could confuse a user uh, if they would actually look into those permissions. We found one user somewhere very deeply hidden in the comments that said, what is it actually doing with my data? It's asking access, I just want the flashlight. But all the other comments were, yeah, I'm really happy with the app, it works fine, but who knows whatever it's doing in the background, right? Um, so I think that's really a wrap up of, of that permission model. It's still quite difficult for a user to judge when installing an app um, to see if that is legitimate or not. Uh, I think on iOS it's a bit easier sometimes because whenever the app starts using the camera, you need to approve. You can say, look, okay, it makes sense. I'm trying to make a profile picture. Um, the app can use the camera. It's different in this case. A few interesting samples, fake token. This was already in the screenshot of, uh, or, or in the Matai slides. So fake token is trying to mimic the interface of a bank, of a token generator, but it's basically going to intercept tokens and send them uh, over SMS uh, or over, over internet to a CNC server. How does it work? Well, the first thing, uh, the mode is operandi is you try to infect the user with a third party infected app, email, third party app store. The user clicks, the app registers read SMS and uh, send SMS in the permission model. The victim starts communicating um, with the, the, the infected phone. Tokens are generated for online banking. Those are intercepted because remember the app requested access to incoming SMS messages. They are forwarded to the bank, of course using uh, the victim's, uh, the attacker's account information and then mules can basically collect the money. It looks like a token generator it doesn't actually generate bank tokens. We've even seen a few of these where the developer of the malware is so lazy that it just generates a static one. That is not even regenerating a new token upon clicking generate. Most of them have some kind of randomness in them. <laughs> but I'll tell you they don't work uh, on actual banking apps. So that's fake token. We've seen that one actually quite a few times on, uh, on our scanner. This one is quite greedy. If the interception of tokens for some reason doesn't work, it can still steal your money by sending text messages to premium numbers. So that's a bit of fallback. Sandbox detection, you already mentioned this uh, before. Indeed, we see quite a few samples being uploaded, trying to fingerprint our sandbox or our workers. In this case, it was indeed analyzed by uh, a soft phone, so an emulator. We forgot to change the name of the emulator and that became quite easy for the researchers of this paper to uh, identify that they were indeed sandboxed. Um, on a physical phone this will not show up and it will again be, be a bit different but that's one of the reasons why we picked a physical phone, right? It becomes more difficult for a malware writer to, uh, to identify that. It also, it also means that they are, they are picking up our, our scanner so even the malware writers are picking up our scanner and they're, finger, they're thinking like hey how can we fingerprint APK scan that they cannot figure out that our piece of software is malware. So that means our, 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 our scanner is really used also by the bad guys. They are looking at us and figuring out like, hey, what does APK scan figure out right now? And there we even see versions, like they upload something, ah, there, yeah. we got it. <laughs> they upload the second version, ah, we got it. And then the third version where they sneak through our, our scanner and then we have to figure out like, hey, how can we, again, detect what they've just created. So it's like a cat and mouse game. Yeah, we see indeed some four or five versions, all malicious, 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 and then, okay, it's good wear, and then they stop uploading. <laughs> and then they probably found a packer or whatever they're doing, encryption that we cannot... Uh, yeah, inspect to it, cat, cat and mouse game, as you mentioned. A uh, good example of this historical analysis, um, what we do here is we also rescan samples. So in this case, we had a sample that didn't look suspicious at all. It was communicated, it actually has an in-app browser. It had quite a lot of embedded links that you can see here. In the first instance, the first time it was uploaded, nothing malicious. But then when we rescanned the app a few months later, we, or a few weeks later, we basically saw, hmm, this is a bit strange. A lot of these link, links contain malware, so they host malware. And then we can blacklist uh, that sample. So it even happens that 
A sample is created by malware writers. It registers domains for uh, command and controls. And they only activate it once they have a sufficient user base. Um, so then you need this kind of technique to, uh, to spot that. Be In this case, we scanned using the uh, Google Safe Browser API uh, to, f to identify that. Um, I'll hand over to, to Matthias for this slide. All right. So, um, sorry. A little bit of the conclusions. So um, I think Android is still the, the platform of choice, right? Uh, what we see is, is a high increase in, in malware samples that come to us. Uh, we see an increase in, in the number of findings, different malware, different packers. It's, it's very interesting. So it's, it's really on the rise, and especially what we focus on is then really the banking malware, and, and we see a lot of interesting examples there. Um, one thing I would like to say is, is we do this as a research project, so we give everything uh, for free on our website. So you can really, if you want to try this out, go to our website, upload your sample, and, and we're going to go through it, and we're going to give you back the results. So uh, you have full access to, that, to all the data that we also have. Even if you think that we miss certain things in our analysis, please let yeah, us know, sure. if you're not one of the bad guys. <laughs> uh, a few slides on future work. So what are we working on? What we discussed is really this uh, behavior analysis in the, um, the user space, right? So a new file is created in the user space. Uh, the permission model is abused, we detect that. But in case that we have an exploit that we don't know yet that is affecting a physical device, what do we do? Well, we can take a snapshot of the memory. We can dump that. We can inspect certain permissions, sorry, certain uh, partitions on that, uh, on that drive. And we can then compare that with a base image. So we take a start state that we know that's clean. We take a disk image from Google, for example. And then we start uh, comparing at the bit level. This is really interesting to, to, to spot new, uh, new exploits. We've tried that historically on older versions uh, with known exploits. This works. And we've released uh, a few of the tools on the DCAM suite that's uh, available online. We're also trying to do a better guess at the maliciousness of an application. It's quite difficult to do this, uh, to decide. Currently, we have three categories. We have goodware, uh, suspicious, or known uh, malicious samples. What we do in this graph is basically trying to um, run the sample through maybe 20 or 30 other analysis techniques besides ours. And we're then going to construct an intelligent tree where we can uh, make a better, more intelligent guess on the maliciousness. So it's perfectly possible that uh, one of the analyzers that only uses the permission model to identify malware is saying, look, it looks good. But if you use another scanner, it might say, um, we're also doing this deep inspection on the operating system. Maybe you should re reconsider. And then we, we um, have a decision in the middle and say, look, it's suspicious. Currently, we cannot do this yet, but that's work in progress with uh, the University of Ghent. And also the physical phone analysis. This is just something that we, we finished uh, a first proof of concept on a larger test bed uh, last month. This is research from Joshua Drake from uh, last year at Black Hat. Uh, we got our inspiration there to really run the analysis on a lot of mobile phones. Uh, and it's also something that we are considering. If anyone wants to fund us through uh, old phones, feel free to, uh, to talk to us after uh, the presentation. And I think we are perfectly fine within our slot, maybe for a few questions. So uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for joining and uh, open to any questions. Thanks. Question? Yeah. Sure. So uh, I'm first going to repeat the question. <laughs> yeah. so, that, so do you recommend your, your, your mother or young boys to, to use an Android? That's essentially the question. Um, it depends for what, I would say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> it depends what they're going to do. <laughs> yeah, it, if you stick to the to official releases of, of the ROMs, so for example the Google phones, if you stick to the official stores, I think you're quite fine. We just see that a lot of people go beyond that. They root their phone. That's just more convenient to do on, on Android rather than on iOS, and then you're more exposed. Uh, with us, a lot of our colleagues use Android. I use uh, mainly iOS. But if you use the platform responsibly, that's fine. I think just think the current ecosystem of Android still gives more opportunity to uh, to expose a device. For example, yeah, a rooted phone. 
becomes quite a bit more vulnerable, of course. And that's a bit more closed, I think, on iOS. Also, historically, there's less malware samples on iOS. Uh, close so, to none, yeah. yeah, close to none uh, that are known. Uh, so that's probably part of the, the answer, yeah. Okay? Yes. The question is, 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 is our, is our uh, project open source or not? Yeah. The front end is not open source, but I also think there's not a lot to contribute. It's a very stupid upload area uh, where you can pull in samples. The interesting part, if you want to collaborate, uh, the framework to create workers, so to pull in a sample, to analyze it and to come back with results, that's something that we can, uh, it's, it's... It's not it, open source, but we can exactly. collaborate on. It, it's so really we're, just, we're, a, yeah. It, we're, so definitely talk to us if you're if you if you want to contribute to our, to our project. So what we want to do is we want to give everything that we scan for free back to the community. Yeah. But the way we work, there's there's of course a little bit of, of work that we spend in there, and there's some IP in there. So yeah. that that's not open source. No. We want to prevent also malware yeah. writers from creating a worker, submitting their results, and uh, basically poisoning the the database. Uh, but the contract uh, to interact with the, the API is just a RESTful, uh, RESTful API that's, that's fully documented. So feel free to talk to us uh, later. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Same speaker again. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Have a good lunch. Yeah.